Amen. Thank you, worship team. And uh, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible today to 1 Timothy. For the last time, we're going to turn to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. That's not true. We will, you will turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy 6 once again, I hope. But uh, we're coming to the end of our series. And so as you're turning there in your Bible, and once you get there, we're just going to take a moment and be still before the Lord and invite him to speak to us today. And so let's just take a moment of silence. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. So Lord, we ask you to speak today, and we ask it in faith in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, as I said, this is the conclusion of our Household of God series, the conclusion of our time in 1 Timothy 6, and I thought it was appropriate as we come to a close uh, to invite you to do a bit of self-reflecting. If you're a first-time visitor, you're just going to have to play along with us here. But for those of you who have sat through the teaching of this letter, I do want to ask you to stop for a moment and to really think, how is your life different today than it was before you spent time in this letter? How has your your attitude changed? How has your thinking changed? How has your belief changed? I want you to, to really think through that. Because here's the thing, as we work through these texts, the goal is not that we would all go away with some more scribbles in the, side, in the margins of our Bible, some more little study notes and factoids. Study is important, to be sure. But we study so as to be changed. That's why, that's why we're doing this. And God's Word tells us that that's how we should approach it. In fact, in James chapter 1, God's Word says this, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so the blessing, as we come to God's word, the blessing is for those who hear and respond. And that's why I invite you into this exercise. I heard this great analogy this past week, um, and it draws on a, a phrase that we use all the time. I use this phrase all the time. We talk about wrestling with the text. Oh, I really wrestled with the text this week. I can't tell you how many times I've said that. I wrestled with the text. Though we don't often talk about the conclusion of that match. And I think for many of us, when we think of wrestling with the text, we mean I wrestled with it until I, could, until I subdued it, until finally it tapped out and I mastered it. But that's the wrong approach. So let me ask you, as you've wrestled with the text of 1 Timothy, who pinned who to the mat? Did you bring all of your presuppositions, all of your ideas, and did you find a way to contort and subdue the text to look like you? Or or did the text subdue you? Did God, by the power of his spirit, change you and pin you to the mat? Because here's the thing. We don't need to become masters of the text, though we want to learn. What we need is to be mastered by the text, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we do this. We don't need more study notes. We need life transformation. So that being said, as we come to a close, let that be our ambition as we wrestle with the text here in 1 Timothy one last time. We're going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to read verses 17 to 21. Hear now God's holy, inspired, inerrant, living, and active word to us today. As for the rich in this present age, Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, Guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now verses 20 to 21 are essentially a recapitulation, a throwback to what we studied last week. And so if you weren't with us last week, I would invite you, you can go back and listen to that online. Paul right here, he's, just, he's bringing it back in and reminding Timothy to take hold. You, know, you need to guard the deposit, the truth that you've received. Don't distort it. Don't hide from it. Don't be ashamed of it. You need to preach it, Timothy. 
Avoid all the nonsense over here and you be faithful. That's what he's saying in verses 20 to 21, and that's what we studied last week. But because we've studied that last week, we're enabled now to lean right into verses 17 to 19, where Paul addresses one last group in the Ephesian church. So he's already taught Timothy how to address certain groups. So if you remember, he First, he talked to Timothy about how he should address the, the young women and the older women and the young men and the older men. And then he leaned in more specifically and said, here's how you need to address the widows. Here's how you pastor them. And here's how you pastor the leaders, Timothy. And here's how you pastor the slaves, Timothy. And here's how you pastor the poor, Timothy. But here he addresses one last group in the Ephesian church, the rich. And before we jump into the instructions, I want to make one general observation that should inform the way we approach this passage. Here's the general observation. I want to be clear right from the outset that it is not a sin to be rich. A few weeks back, we read Paul's instructions for the poor Christians in the Ephesian church. They were longing to be rich. And in those instructions, it includes one of the most frequently misquoted verses in all the Bible. You've probably heard it said that money is the root of all evil. But of course, that's not what the text says. If you look at chapter 6, verse 10, what does he say? Paul says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So the money itself is not the problem. The problem is the heart that possesses the money. Or perhaps you could say the heart that is possessed by the money. All kinds of evil spring from that heart that's in love with money, but not everyone who has money is a lover of money. Our passage this morning, you think about it, is written to help Timothy to understand how to pastor the rich Christians in his church, which means there are rich Christians in his church. Let's notice also, as, as Paul is instructing Timothy on how to speak to them, that nowhere in our passage this morning is Timothy told to shame them into to throwing away all of their wealth. On the contrary, he's instructed to remind these wealthy Christians that every good gift they have is from God. The God who, if you look at the second half of verse 17, the God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So as we build our theology of money, let's make sure that this verse factors in as well. That not only is it not a sin to be wealthy, but God actually invites us to enjoy the gift that he's given to us. As one commentator notes, this is an important addition. We're not to exchange materialism for asceticism. On the contrary, God is a generous creator who wants us to appreciate the good gifts of creation. And I'm giving this introduction because anytime we discuss money, there, there are ditches on either side of the road. We often use this ditch language. But there are ditches on either side of the road. There's the ditch of materialism, and the materialist loves money and is absorbed with money, and they want to disregard every warning in Scripture, because there, there are lots of them. They want to disregard all of the warnings in Scripture about wealth, and they want to pursue it at all costs. So obviously that's a ditch, right? But then on the other side of the road, there's this ditch of asceticism, and the ascetic fears money and flees from money and, and actually looks at anybody who has money with distrust and suspicion and disdain and I know there's a ditch there because truth be told I've spent a lot of my life in that ditch or at least close to it but that's wrong too in this passage Paul is calling upon Timothy to teach the rich, rich Christians in the church how to walk the narrow road that leads to life and we need to hear this brothers and sisters because we are rich now, whenever we hear the term rich, our minds are inclined to jump to those who have more money than us, right? We think, oh, oh, good, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about richness because rich Bobby is here, and rich Bobby, boy, he needs to hear this, rich Bobby does. And perhaps rich Bobby does need to hear this, but so do you, and so do I, because we are rich. If you have a roof over your head, if you know where your food is going to come from this week, then you are rich by all historical standards. This word is for us. And there were rich Christians like us in Timothy's church. They needed to hear some things from their pastor. So as we conclude this series, we're going to ask one last question of the text, which is this. What do rich Christians need to hear? First, Paul tells Timothy that rich Christians need to hear that wealth can easily lead 
to pride. Look at verse 17. It says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Now, haughty is a, it's a synonym for prideful. That's, that's what he's saying. Charge them not to be prideful. Those who have wealth are going to face a real temptation toward a spirit, an attitude of pride. It's hard to be humble in a Lamborghini, right? We understand this. Put another way, maybe a more practical way, you know, you don't have the Lamborghini. Put another way, Timothy is to warn the rich Christians not to adopt this I'm a self-made man mindset that is so prevalent in their world and in ours. Is there any one of us here today who doesn't secretly love when people recognize our hard work and our successes? Is there any one of us who doesn't really enjoy when, when someone asks us to tell the story of our success? You know, well, you know, I came, I came from poverty, actually. My parents didn't have a lot of money, but you know, I, work, I worked hard, and I, I was prudent, I saved, and I was, I was wise with my investments, and now I, I'm here. I guess, it's, I guess it is a bit of a rags to riches story, isn't it? Wow, look at me. Follow me on Instagram and be inspired daily. The logical, though, unspoken implication of that line of thinking is that people who aren't successful and people who aren't as wealthy as you didn't work hard and weren't wise. We don't say that, but that's the implication. But here, let me be careful. The challenge is that there's a bit of truth to that sometimes. According to the Bible, sometimes poverty is the result of laziness. For example, Proverbs 10.4 says that a slack hand causes poverty but the hand of the diligent makes rich. So, so sometimes there is a line that we can draw from hard work to success. So how do we hold that intention? Well, here's how we hold that intention. We as Christians need to recognize that there are so many other factors that we have no control over. Like the strength in your body that enables you to roll out of bed each day. Not everyone has that. Or the legs that you use to walk up the steps to that interview. Not everybody has those. Or the intelligence that you maximize to get those grades. Not everybody has that. You know, there might have been somebody in your class behind you who worked just as hard as you did and you got an A plus average and they got a C minus average. They worked just as hard as you. Or the people skills that you have, or the freedom that you have, the opportunity that you have, the parents that you have, the country that you were born into. You worked hard and that is admirable. But recognize that there is an infinite list of things that have contributed to your success that you had absolutely nothing to do with. And let that determine whether or not you can adopt the self-made man mindset of your culture. That's prideful. Isn't it interesting? We're so fast to blame God for everything that goes wrong in our lives, yet we're so slow to credit him for any of our successes. So practically... Do you ever find yourself looking down your nose at those who are less fortunate than you, those who have less success? That's a dangerous mindset. Do you find yourself flaunting, maybe not overtly, but you can feel it in your heart, flaunting your house, flaunting your wealth, flaunting your, your clothing, your car? It's a dangerous, dangerous pride that's rooted in your heart. Do you find yourself itching to tell the story of your impressive rise to success? And this is a particular danger for a generation that is so infatuated with social media as we are. It's one of the reasons why social media exists, is so that we can invite people into our amazing story. Scroll through the post from your last year. Are you telling the story of how generous and worthy of praise your God is? Or are you telling the story of how awesome and worthy of praise you are? That's poison for your soul. And that's poison for the souls of all those hundreds of people that are following you. And it's poison for the souls of those two or three little ones that are following you in your house. It has to go. So Paul says to Timothy, rich Christians need to be reminded that wealth, gift that it is, can easily lead to pride. They need to be reminded that there probably should be a warning label attached to their paycheck. Thank God for your wealth, but, but you do need to guard your heart from the pride that can easily accompany with it. That's the first thing that wealthy Christians need to hear. Second, wealthy Christians need to hear that wealth has no power to save. 
We see this in the second half of verse 17. Look there again. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Because here's the thing. You pray differently when your bank account is full. So just let it get real practical. If, if you look at your savings account and you find yourself feeling a little bit, of, a little bit invincible, then this warning is for you. Rich Christians face a particular temptation of placing their trust in their money rather than in their God. See, when Jesus taught us how to pray, what did he teach us to pray? Remember? Give us this day our daily bread. And for most Christians throughout the history of the world, when they prayed those words, it was an urgent, literal prayer. Right? For most Christians throughout the history of the world, it was... I need needs today. I've got, I don't know how I'm going to eat today. God, meet my needs, please. But we are in a, a unique historical position, you and I. When we pray those words, it, it means something different. We've got meals for a month. We know where our food's going to come from for this entire year. Some of us in this room have saved up so much that, that we actually don't need to work ever again. If we never work another day in our lives, we will have food to eat until the day that we die. And praise God for that, but that is unique. You're enjoying a gift that most Christians throughout the history of the world couldn't even imagine. And let me take this opportunity to remind you that it's not sinful to be wealthy or to have savings. So don't hear it that way. In fact, God's word teaches us that it's wise and right to lay up some savings for the future. For example, in Proverbs 13.22, we read, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So savings are not wrong in and of themselves. Don't hear that. However, Timothy needed to remind the rich Christians in Ephesus of the very real risk that accompanies the wealth. And rich Christians face this temptation of misplacing their hope. See, the the poor Christian wakes up and prays, God, Give me this day my daily bread. I don't know how I'm going to eat today if you don't provide. I don't know how I will survive this day unless unless you come in, unless you enter in and meet my needs. The rich Christian, however, often rolls out of bed and goes about his day and moseys about his business. He plays with his toys and eats his food and lies down at night and goes, oh, I forgot. Good night, God. And how many of us have have gone through days just like that? Or perhaps weeks just like that? Or perhaps months just like that? Why is that? Why is it that so many of us as rich Christians are prone to prayerlessness? It's because when you have money, it's easy to fall into the trap of placing your hope in your money. And when you have money, it's easy to convince yourself that you can handle anything that comes your way because of your money. And when you have money, you can even begin to feel invincible. But here's the thing. Invincible people don't pray very often. Invincible people don't look forward to heaven very often. Invincible people affix their hope to temporary pleasures rather than eternal glory. And Paul says to Timothy, you need to warn the rich Christians in your church of that because that is a very real and present danger for them. Because wealth can evaporate in an instant. Notice That's what he says in the text. The uncertainty of riches. We're all so certain about our uncertain riches. It can evaporate in an instant. There there were wealthy Christians who are presently living as refugees fleeing from their country in the Ukraine. There are wealthy Christians who are presently getting ready for a job interview after an unexpected job loss. Wealthy Christians sitting in a waiting room waiting for chemotherapy treatment. And those wealthy Christians are painfully presently being reminded and learning that wealth can't sustain our hope through the tragedies of life because wealth has no power to save. Therefore, Paul says, remind the rich in your church to fix their hope on God because he's the only one who is worthy of it. Because he's the only one who can rescue you even from the grave itself. The wealthy Christians in Timothy's church needed to hear that. And friends, so too do we. Third, wealthy Christians need to hear that to whom much is given, much is required. 
Look with me at verse 18. It says, They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Paul uses a play on words here to make his point. He says, tell the rich Christians that they should pursue being rich in good works. Right? He said, this is, this is the treasure that you should pursue. The real blessing of your wealth is the opportunity that it affords to be generous. I right, let's just say that again. The real blessing of your wealth, rich Christian, is the opportunity that it affords you to be generous. What a gift that is. And Paul has just finished saying that God is the one who richly provides. Your wealth comes from God. That is what he's saying. It's from him. He has richly provided this for you. Timothy, therefore, is to remind the rich Christians in his church where their wealth came from, and then he's to charge them to use that gift to be rich in good works. Because wealth is a gift, but it's also a test. God gives it to us, but then he watches what we do with it. And one day, we'll stand before him and we'll give an account for how we stewarded this gift. Jesus said, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand much more. The rich need to be reminded of that. See, God has blessed us with, many of us here, with more money than we'll ever need. So when he gives us more than we need, what do we do with the surplus? Do we buy the bigger house or the nicer car? Or do we find a wise way to share that abundance with those who are in need? Listen, the big house isn't sinful. And when I say big house, let's be honest, we all live in big houses by comparative standards to the world. So not shaming anybody with a big house. There's nothing wrong with the big house or the nice car. The question is, what is the heart that motivates buying the big house or the nice car? And Paul says, you need to think through this. To whom much is given, much is required. Think of it this way. God is the father of every believer in the world. We believe that. He loves every believer in the world. He loves them equally. We believe that, right? He loves every believer in the world equally. And God, in his infinite wisdom, he has put some of his children... Cause them to be born into the lap of luxury. Hello, that's us. Cause us to be born in, into the most affluent country in the most affluent time period in the history of the world. He loves us. God equally loves those believers who he has caused to be born into poverty and famine. He loves us both. Each of us have unique challenges that are accompanied with the place where God's put us. He put us here for a reason. And each of us have unique benefits that accompany where he's put us. Let's just think through it. So for the rich Christian, we've got challenges that come with being rich Christians. We have the challenge of, of how our wealth is going to probably tempt us towards pride, like Paul's been saying. How we're going to be tempted to hoard this wealth. How we're going to be tempted to become so infatuated with this world that we're going to forget about God and heaven altogether, that's a real challenge for rich Christians. Whereas for poor Christians, they're going to have the challenge of, of wrestling with discontentment for their whole life. They're going to have the challenge of, of having this heart that is bubbling up with a longing for wealth and a love for wealth that could lead them into ruin. But Paul addresses both of those groups of Christians and both of those challenges in this one letter. Right? But along with those challenges, there are opportunities. So let's think about the poor. The poor have the opportunity to learn contentment. The poor have the opportunity to learn how to depend on God in ways that you and I will never understand. The poor will have an easier time fixing their hope on eternity. And in fact, according to God's word, the poor are more likely to prepare themselves well for that glorious future. Jesus said this. After the rich young ruler walked away sad, Jesus said, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus said that. The one who is poor is uniquely positioned, better positioned, to be rich forever. Which is why Jesus taught us that ultimately the first will be last and the last will be first. 
Well, then you say, perhaps I should just give away all of my possessions and I should run for the hills and flee from wealth. And listen, let me say this. If, if wealth is causing you to be overwhelmed with pride and it's causing you to let go of heaven and hold on to the world, then perhaps you should do something radical. Jesus also said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So maybe God is calling you to do something radical today and I don't want to take that weight off of you. However, the medicine that Paul applies here that he calls Timothy to apply to the church, is to remind them that to whom much is given, much is required. That's medicine for the rich Christian. Remember. And this leads to the opportunity that that comes to us as rich Christians. Think about this opportunity that we have. We can be more generous than anybody in the history of the world. So we've talked about, like, for example, the retired Christian. The retired Christian is in a very, very unique historical position. You are one of a very select group of people in the history of the world who could literally do good works all day long and you would still have food to eat for yourself and your family. That's an amazing opportunity. Praise God for that. Use that opportunity. And for the rich Christians, we have wealth that affords us the opportunity to be generous in ways that poor Christians could never even fathom. There are things that we can do with our wealth that would just... Blow their socks off. You could, you could train five pastors in India today. You could use your wealth to do that. You could use your wealth right now to, to, to buy a church building for that church in the Dominican Republic. Like You could do that. It might not even affect your monthly budget all that much. You could buy a house for that widow. The one who, has, the one who is rich has the opportunity to be rich in good deeds. Rich Christians should take a hard look at the needs around us. And we should take a hard look at the means that God has entrusted to us. And we should take a hard look at the amount that we've decided to keep for ourselves. Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched. And the one who waters will himself be watered. I love that imagery. The one who waters will be watered. I wonder if we believe that. Many of us in this room are like watering cans that have been filled to the brim. Can you picture that? We look at the blessings that we've received, it seems almost too good to be true. But the water in the watering can is meant to be poured out. That's why the watering can exists. And if that watering can sits idle, filled to the brim with water, never sharing a drop with the world, then the watering can actually begins to stink. The water becomes stagnant. And the very thing that was meant to be a blessing becomes a stench and a curse. Rather than bringing life, it winds up bringing death. Therefore, Paul says, Timothy, remind those rich Christians that to whom much is given, much is is required. The ability to give a gift is a gift in and of itself. Help them to see the opportunity that they have and remind them that one day they will answer to the Father of all. Finally, flowing out of what we just discussed, and this is our last point, rich Christians need to hear that spiritual treasure is the only treasure that lasts. Look with me at verses 18 to 19. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Here Paul is clearly alluding to what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. If you you can flip back in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, let me just show you where, where Jesus says this. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 19 to 21. I'll just give you a second. But Paul's language is almost verbatim. Right? He's drawing from this teaching that we received from Christ. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
That's what Paul's drawing our attention to. I recently heard a story of a rich woman's funeral, and I don't remember where the story's from, though I'm sure there are plenty of stories like this. But this is a rich woman, and she had inherited a large uh, inheritance. And she passed away, and her cousins were curious. And so they approached her accountant, and they said, we're just wondering, how, mu how much of that fortune did she leave behind? And the accountant looked back at them, and the accountant said, oh, she left it all behind. She took nothing with her. We take nothing with us, friends. When we view our lives with that eternal perspective, it changes what we might regard as a wise investment, doesn't it? What is a wise investment? A wise investment is one that is going to give you maximum return over the long haul. You want to find that kind of investment. Well, when we're thinking about eternity, suddenly the equation changes just a little bit. The wise investment is the investment that lays up treasure for you into eternity. So you could buy the bigger house and enjoy the increased equity and ride the wave. You could do that, of course. Or you could train those pastors in India and you could worship with the hundreds of men and women who come to Christ under the preaching of the gospel. You could worship with them forever. Or you could buy the nice car. You could do that. You could spend the next 20 years meticulously maintaining it and giving it your time and putting your attention, and that's okay. Or you could use that wealth and you could come alongside a family around you who's struggling and you could, you could give them a gift that they could never imagine receiving and you could tell them about Christ and walk with them. Just be, just be wise. Jesus, or Proverbs 19, sorry, says, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. Isn't that amazing? He will repay him for his deed. We have the opportunity as rich Christians to lend to the poor. We haven't dealt faithfully with our text until we've wrestled with the sobering warning that Paul gives at the end of verse 19. I want to just read this again, make sure that we hear it. So he says, wealthy Christians are called to be generous and to store up treasures in heaven so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. He's saying, you need to pursue this generosity because you don't want to miss out on that which is life. The biggest danger that accompanies wealth is its ability to rob us of the only treasure that ultimately matters. The rich need to be generous because in doing so, they will take hold of of eternal life. There's a reason why Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because wealthy Christians can easily become worldly Christians. And wealthy Christians can easily become complacent Christians. And worldly complacent Christians aren't really Christians at all, are they? Because to be a Christian is to follow Christ. And Christ called us to take up our cross. To pursue him over and above all of the worldly comforts and pleasures that are offered to us. And that is a hard invitation for wealthy Christians. Nay, it is an impossible invitation for wealthy Christians, apart from a miraculous work of the Spirit. One of the ways that wealthy Christians can take hold of that which is truly life is by resolving to be generous. Can I just shift something in your mind for a moment? Generosity is, you could say, in itself, it's a form of spiritual warfare. In our generosity, we are waging war with the pride and the greed and the worldliness that is often wielded against us by the evil one as rich Christians. So I want to say this carefully. I'm going to touch on something that is potentially sensitive and with a disclaimer that I don't want this to sound legalistic and I don't want to be legalistic. Let me pray for a second. Lord, just help me to say this wisely and let it be heard correctly and... Uh, Lord, we just ask for your help. Amen. Uh, I feel like I should say this because we live in a culture where, where we're all working two or three jobs, and that is, that is celebrated, um, right? So if you go on Facebook or you go on Instagram, like, we, we really celebrate this in our day and age. We call, we've got terms for them, affectionate terms, like the side hustle, you're the side gig, right? And we're all really proud of that. And let me say this, nothing wrong with industry. There's nothing wrong with hard work. So, nothing wrong with that in and of itself. 
But let's recognize that we live in a culture that is, is going to be applauding us and cheering us on. And so there's going to be all kinds of incentive for us to pursue that. And my question is, what is the heart behind the side hustle? And as Christians, we need to think very carefully about this. Now, some people are forced to work two or three jobs because that's the only way that they can put a meal on the table for their family. Right? For some people, that's their reality. But there are others who really don't need a second or a third job. They pursue it for other reasons. And I believe that God's word would call us just to, to check our heart here. Because it does say something to our children when mom and dad come home from work and then as a hobby go back to work. It says something to them. And there is opportunity cost. And I'm not a prophet, so, but I would suspect that there won't be a single person in this room who on our deathbed will say, I wish I had invested more time into my career or my second career. I wish that I had accumulated more money. I don't think a single one of us will say that. But I suspect that many of us will be saying, I wish that I would have, I would give anything to be back at that dinner table with my family, opening the word of God, telling my kids about Jesus. Like, I, w- I would give anything to go back in time and to invest more into their eternal souls, to open up more time in my schedule, to invite my neighbors into my house. I'd give anything for that. Let's hear that because, again, we're going to feel a strong push. And I, I just see it pastorally. I see it. I look out, and we are all so busy, and sometimes for good reason. But I would just maybe add the, a voice in your mind that says, be careful. I'd add a question in your mind that says, why are we doing this? Do we need this? Is the cost worth it? Wealthy Christians, God's word is calling us to take hold of that which is truly life. Meaning, meaning as rich Christians, we're going to feel a real temptation to take hold of something which is false life. Something which we are sold and we're told that this is life, but in fact we're going to find out in the long run that that wasn't life, that was a missed opportunity. He says take hold of that which is truly life. And if that means letting go of your second job, then just let it go. And if that means downsizing your house so that you don't need the second and third job, then downsize the house and let it go. And if that means putting a line in your budget called generosity to spur you on, to look for opportunities, to bless the people around you, then put that in your budget. Because God has given us a gift. It's a gift. It's land here. Praise God that he's given us this gift. It glorifies him when we enjoy this gift that we've received. But wealthy Christians need to remember that the gift carries with it some dangers. Wealth is good, but it can easily lead to pride. Remember that. Wealth is good, but it has no power to save. Remember that. Wealth is good, but to whom much is given, much will be required. Wealth is good, but spiritual treasure is the only treasure that lasts. So enjoy the gift that you've received, but steward it carefully. Use the temporary treasure that you have today to store up permanent treasure for tomorrow. And whatever you do, don't let go of that which is truly life in your pursuit of that which is here today but gone tomorrow. Paul says this is what wealthy Christians need to hear. This is the conclusion of Paul's letter to Timothy. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, first and foremost, we just want to thank you. Uh, We thank you for your amazing generosity towards us. And Lord, as I say that, I'm not thinking about the, the money in our bank accounts or the food on our tables or the roof over our heads. Lord, we're thankful for all of that, Lord. I'm thankful for the generosity that you've shown in sending your son to live for us the life we couldn't live, to die for us the death that we deserve, to raise and to sit on the throne and to invite us into the kingdom of heaven forever. God, we are a people who should be overflowing with gratitude. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us a greater view of you today. I pray that your word would would land on us and would wrestle us and pin us to the mat. And Lord, that's going to look different for each one of us. Lord, I pray against a legalistic mindset that can easily creep in. Lord, if I've said anything that's unhelpful in that sense, God, I just thank you 
that by the power of your spirit, you will just cause that to be forgotten and drop to the floor. Uh, Lord, that's, we don't need any more rules or regulations. What we need is a new heart. And your word calls us to, to behold Christ. And as we do that, everything else falls into proper alignment. Lord, it's possible that someone's here today and Christ is not first in their heart. And maybe when they walked in the doors, they thought that he was. But upon examination and the application of, of your word by your spirit, they see that there's an idol that's crept in, an idol that's, that they've given the throne. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of idols being cast down in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be first in the hearts of every single man and woman, boy and girl here today. And only you can do this, so we ask that you would. I pray that you would help us. Lord, we've been thinking about ourselves individually, but I pray for us as a church, as we're about to go into an annual general meeting and we ourselves possess wealth as a congregation. Lord, let us apply this corporately. Help us to be good stewards of that which you've entrusted to us. Help us to be kingdom-minded, to have an eternal perspective. Lord, I pray that we would store up treasures that ultimately last. So Lord, in all of these things, we ask for your help. Lord, we are so grateful for your mercy to us. Lord, I acknowledge that there's not a single person in this room who has done it perfectly right. There's not a single person in this room who's ever handled the, the things that you've entrusted to them with perfect wisdom. And so, God, we can rest in the fact that Jesus paid for our shortcomings. He paid for our sin and our foolishness and the times that we've made idols. If we've placed our trust in Christ, then that has been washed away from us, removed as far as the east is from the west. And yet, Lord, we ask for more wisdom because it's our desire that we would leave from this place and that we would conduct ourselves and our finances and our homes in a way that further brings you glory. So please help. We ask this in faith, and we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Worship team, would you lead us?